How's it going? Hey Mark, I'm good. How are you? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mark. I'm the founder of Beta, the platform for sending and receiving digital audio. And along with uh, Mode and everyone over at Sled Island, I want to welcome you all and the panelists. Want to welcome you all to the third Tete Tete uh, chat talk event called "What Is Acceptable Music Technology." The one thing I wanted to say about this event is uh, just like I was saying, sometimes it's slow for things to come together. Um, but one of the things I think is super special about these events is no matter who it is, someone at Swan Island, someone at Beta, or us working together, all these ideas come from us and ideas that we've heard about or people that we've met or things that we've experienced out in our normal day to day work. And so in this case, uh, Usually Mo does a short intro and then I talk, I think. But this time, it's this is essentially 100% you, right, Mo? I believe you've been <laughs> talking to a couple of the panelists previously, and then suddenly you came and said, look, I've got the perfect idea for a tete-a-tete. -tete. What do you think? And if I remember correctly, it came together quite quick, quickly. Is that correct? Yeah, it did. So the, the idea... Uh, behind this talk was uh, developed in collaboration with uh, our co-presenter today, the National Access Arts Centre. They are Canada's oldest and largest multidisciplinary disability arts organization, and we're very lucky to have them here in Calgary. They do really incredible work. Uh, and they reached out to us at Sled Island a few months ago to see if we wanted to support and participate a year long digital music project that they will be launching in September. Uh, and all of the three panelists uh, that we have today will also be involved in this project along with Sled Island. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we got talking that way and it seemed like, you know, it's a, definitely a really interesting field, something we haven't explored a lot with Slat Island to this day. So uh, yeah, the idea came pretty quick together and they already had the perfect panelists to suggest. And so, yeah, it just seemed like a, a really great idea and I'm, uh, I'm super excited for it to see happen today. Excellent. And do you want to introduce the panelists? Sure. So uh, we have today, we have Charles Matthews and Giv Chuma from Blurring the Boundaries, as well as Stefana Fratilla uh, from Creep Raves. And I guess we're going to hand it over to them because really they are the one we want to hear more from. So hi, guys. Hello. Passing hi and goodbye. Yeah, pass it on the mic <laughs> on to you and thank you for being here. And, and thanks to our interpreters as well. That's very important. Thank to you very much. Thank you very much. Right, well, thanks so much. Um, I think uh, this conversation feels like it's been a while in the making um, because uh, certainly with Stefano, we've been speaking on social media for, I don't know, how, how long has it been? Um, I don't know. COVID has kind of confused my sense of time, but... I think a few years, maybe even. Yeah, that's my excuse these days as, as well. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> somehow it's fallen it's fallen upon me to to get this uh, get this started. But uh, I mean, if we could maybe introduce ourselves, um, and uh, I, I know that Gift and I have got a, a couple of rants prepared, and um, and then we'll maybe hand over to you or ask, ask a few questions, get a conversation started, if that, if that sounds okay. Yeah. Um, starting, just starting with myself, my name's Charles Matthews. Um, I describe myself, uh, I don't know, as a proudly neurodivergent um, artist. Uh, I've been working in this 
kind of field of I don't yeah accessible music technology it's something that I feel like I'm I'm really just I don't know deconstructing a lot um but that 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 came about um, through contact with an organization called Drake Music in London that I've been working with for about five, five or six years now. But um, more recently have set up an organization over here with, uh, with GIFT uh, called uh, Blowing the Boundaries. Um, but in past lives, um, I've been an electronic musician focusing on kind of bass heavy music and experimental electronics. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and just to, oh yeah, just to audio describe myself for anybody, this is going to be useful to, uh, white man wearing glasses in the dying, dying breaths of his thirties, um, wearing an Algorave t-shirt, which is a collective that, uh, kind of combine algorithms and live coding with, uh, with dance music. And, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's most of what you need to learn about me. Can I hand over to you, Stefana? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Stefana Fratilla, and um, I use she, her pronouns. I am a white settler, and I have a kind of orange hue hair tone right now. Um, I'm wearing a black Nike hoodie, um, and I have a bunch of bookcases behind me, which are color-coded. Um, and I'm here as kind of a couple of different, wearing a different couple of different hats. Um, I'm a composer and I've been making electronic music for a long time. Um, and I also uh, co-founded Crip Rave Collective, um, which is a event platform. And we basically put on raves and events and workshops. And we're specifically trying to create spaces that are more accessible. So although our events are for everyone, um, we're trying to make more accessible um, music events, basically. Yeah. All right, I guess that, that leaves me. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gift Chuma. Um, I am a black uh, cis male a wheelchair user, and um, yeah, I'm wearing glasses and a white shirt with bicycles. I kind of look preppy like, and there's a reason for that because uh, I just jumped off from work. Um, so uh, I, I hope that's good enough of an excuse to looking somewhat preppy. Um, I am a disability rights activist and a disabled artist. Um, I've been in the music scene for quite some time, um, a little bit uh, close to 20 years. And um, I got into uh, accessible music technology in the last three years uh, when uh, Charles and I uh, and uh, David Bobier co-founded um, learning the boundaries. And um, yeah, it's been a very exciting uh, journey and uh, we're only just getting started. And it, it doesn't feel like it's been three years, but uh, yeah, here we are. And I'm just looking forward to, to sharing uh, experiences um, and uh, looking forward to conversing uh, more with you. And I'll hand it over to Charles now. Great, thanks. So the, I mean, the theme we were throwing about ideas before this about, you know, what, well, what we could call it, and it's difficult not to drift into plays on words in these situations. Um, what is acceptable music technology? What is accessible music technology? And um, there are a couple of, uh, yeah, a couple of approaches to that. Um, I guess I, I've, um, I'm going to go way off track if I don't uh, refer to my notes here. So I think I'm, I'm going to just kind of uh, go through a few thoughts that, um, that I've prepared and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through some of that uh, in, in a bit more detail. And we've got a few clips to play as well. So um, just in terms of what blurring the boundaries is, um, so as, as, as Gift mentioned, we uh, founded this, it's a relatively new 
disabled community led not for profit organization. We're based in Montreal. Um, but we're starting to work across Canada, and one of our, uh, our, our key partners in this is Vibrofusion Lab, David Bobia, based in, uh, in Ontario. Um, and what we're doing at the moment is we're working on online meetups through an emerging network, the Canadian Accessible Musical Instrument Network. Um, and we're working on access reviews for some app development over in the UK and over here. And um, yeah, we're just about to start on some work with NAC on, on some remote collaboration. Um, and we're, we're all kind of into experimenting and collaborating one way or another. Uh, the name Blurring the Boundaries comes from a project that we ran a couple of years ago as part of a UK Canada artistic exchange program called New Conversations. And, and the Blurring the Boundaries thing represents an approach that we wanted to explore, um, kind of finding ways to recognize that artists don't just occupy one role or one style, one genre, one, one discipline, whether we like it or not. So for example, um, musicians might find themselves doing all sorts of other things like visuals, promotion, handling the accounts, obviously, coding, going as far as building their own instruments, perhaps having to hack existing instruments to make them accessible. And that's, you know, that, that counts whether you identify as disabled, non-disabled, deaf, hearing, neurotypical, neurodivergent. I mean, it happens to some extent, and it's something that we wanted to, to really push into. Um, so, so taking that idea a bit further, um, the, the existing boundaries, the labels for these roles, the way that we define, in, in our case, music and music, musicianship, uh, the way that we think about the standards of the quality of our work, all these kind of ways that, I mean, they become ways of categorizing people. It can lead to artists being overlooked because they don't fit into the conventional boxes. And in a lot of cases, that can mean that people don't even get started because they've been told all their life that they're never going to meet the standards. They don't have the skills, the training that they don't have access to, that they shouldn't bother trying because the instruments just won't work for them. Or what they're doing isn't music, isn't that particular type of music or art. It won't sell. It's not going to be acceptable. That's it's one side of that acceptable music technology that we're we're talking about today. Um, I, it raises questions like, is this going to be acceptable to the general public? Is it going to be accepted on our own terms or is it going to be put on a pedestal going to the other side of the scale because it ticks boxes or because it's in inspiring to see people breaking down their barriers? Um, so yeah, how can accessible music technology really be uh, appreciated in a way that um, we can convey that, I mean, access is enhancing the experience uh, rather than it's, it's something that is lesser or that is perhaps bolted on and it's getting in the way. Um, so this, uh, this is the rant, the rant bit coming up, I guess. So I, I struggle with the word technology in a way that makes me feel crazy and at odds with the world. Um, I struggle with the way that it's used to draw a line between different sorts of practice and who has a right to, um, to do certain things or who, um, for me, technology as well, it's, it's not always going to be a computer or a circuit board. It's, uh, the way I'm trying to look at it certainly is like, a, the tools, the knowledge of those tools, but it's not necessarily something that's, um, that's digital. Um, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm bringing that up because so much of what we're doing is, is based around digital technology, um, but it's more like we're, we're trying to blend it with uh, playing techniques, ways of, of approaching the music or various other um, art forms that can help smooth it out or automate the things that we don't necessarily have the access to. Um, so yeah, in terms of the, the roles, it's like the technician or the, the techie, the, um, the technical person that, yeah, it's, there's a lot to unpack there, I think. Um, so yeah, we still need to recognize those gaps and, and, and we need, not everybody wants to be that technician or a sound engineer or, or, or do everything themselves. Um, but we think it, maybe it's important to recognize where people are dipping into those other roles and, and have skills that are not being recognized. Um, 
and perhaps there can be some really small steps that we can take to move from dependence that's been set up on other people to taking control of, uh, of the environment uh, to remove some artificial barriers. Um, but there's, I don't know, there's, there seems to be a systemic problem there that results in people being able to identify as the makers or the technicians dictating whether others can access the situation that we kind of need to, um, to look at. Um, the way that we try and approach this is that uh, we're trying to get, well, get people playing, get people into a room or a virtual space, improvising in a way that's going to work for everybody. And that often means taking on a few different approaches. Um, and equality doesn't always mean doing the same thing. Often it's quite the opposite. Um, the format that we're working on at the moment is, uh, is essentially it's a jam session. Uh, the focus usually ends up on what we can call music, making music one way or another. And we'll have a, an instrument or a web app that we've been working on as a starting point that we want to take to people and, and see if we can take it apart or, uh, or play, make something with it. We've had to get some really specific things going in the last year because we need to find ways to make things work online. Um, and in some cases, rather than using a Zoom call, we'll be using uh, a specific web app that kind of becomes the environment where, where we're communicating. Um, I, I know Gift is going to cover some of this a bit later on, and I've been talking for a while. So what I'll do now is I just want to play a little clip of uh, some of the things that, that we've been making more practically. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, I think some of this we'll, we'll need to come back to. I had a nice late night thinking about this last night. So I'll just, uh, <laughs> I'll just play this. So share sound and the desktop. There we go. So just describing what's going on, on the screen. Um, first up, this is a circuit board that we've uh, we've made. It's actually includes a couple of other commercial circuit boards. It's a sensor-based instrument. It's something that um, you can move your hand around or another body part, and it will produce sound according to the distance. I won't talk about what these things are necessarily. We could get into details later on if you like. This one's a bit of a jam session, Gift and I, on um, hand tracking. So moving from that kind of uh, hardware musical instrument into something that works on a screen and a camera. The positions of our hands are controlling various waves on the screen and they're also ducking out some of the other sounds. So on the screen here, we've got um, a poem uh, by a collaborator named Amy Lowe. Mechanical and blending. The words of the poem have been cut up. And the user can use a screen reader, voiceover, or a mouse to select the sounds as loops. And uh, on the screen right now, they're kind of painting on the screen using those words from the subtitle file. I'm embarrassed to say I, I can't remember the name of the podcast that we ripped this, uh, that audio from. We'll have to maybe give that a credit later on. And the last in this little set of clips is um, it's a live painting with sound situation um, where you have two players or more. Um, and on the left-hand side of the screen, some a, a different color has come up. There are kind of streaks appearing depending on who's playing. In this case, dragging over a touch screen or a mouse. And the sounds are matching up um, 
playing melodies. That's happening in real time online. So it's like a musical chat room. So we saw some examples of, I mean, more traditional uh, towards the start, what we might call accessible music technology. Um, and what we're starting to work on in terms of online solutions. Um, one of the issues that, that we want to uh, we want to address, I think I've, I've started touching on this and I'm really wrapping up here, is that uh, a lot of the time it's it the opportunities aren't there for people to develop things themselves or sometimes um, the solutions that people are already making uh, are not being recognized and, and, and something else is being, uh, is being put forward as a kind of a more acceptable version, a, a polished version. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of great instrument developing, going, development going on and we, we obviously need more access um, to these technologies. Um, but we're really keen to, to find out how we could get more deaf and disabled people. Um, well, find out what people are doing already for starters, and but but maybe see where the gaps are actually not as big as we uh, as we might think. And sometimes that's a case of crossing over into in something else, which might not be necessarily considered music, but gives us a bridge where we can we can start playing. Um, but I, yeah, I think I might I might hand over to Gift at this point if that's okay to to talk about like how we're how we're looking at that i feel like i've been talking for some time is that okay with you yeah that's okay okay, okay great there's going to be a great blog post coming out of those notes at some point i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> but yeah definitely yeah so as we have been experimenting with uh, uh digital music uh, instruments and such um, we have actually committed into um, taking kind of like uh, a jazz approach into how we conduct uh, these jam sessions or even how we even um, create uh, these instruments. And um, by taking that jazz approach that, that uh, is very much dependent on improvisation, uh, we are able to um, express music in ways that we wouldn't have. We're able to express our creativity, whether it's within hacking or uh, jamming in, in ways that we wouldn't have anticipated or expected to reach uh, from the get-go. Now, before I get too excited about talking about uh, uh, our improvisation approach, um, I'd just like to um, first like talk a little bit about how uh, music expression has been like uh, for disabled artists um, historically in general. Um, and what I've noticed um, is that a lot of uh, world-renowned uh, disabled uh, artists um, that we know um, have had to kind of fit within the mold um, that has been set out by society. And what I mean by that is that um, there hasn't been really much room um, for one to engage with music, technology, and performance outside the um, already predetermined constraints. And with that, um, it leads to the trap of internalized ableism. Um, and this internalized ableism is sifting into uh, the minds of like some disabled artists like myself, uh, particularly around what is um, considered access acceptab accessible slash acceptable music technology. Um, so my music journey over the last 20 years has been quite, quite interesting. Um, technology, music technology was not accessible or designed with artists like me in mind. Um, 
And what I've done is I've used the software uh, that are not necessarily accessible and we made them accessible by um, repurposing or like misusing them. And, um, but um, from someone from the, the outside looking in uh, might deem this uh, as not being accessible music technology. And the way that we made these accessible to us uh, was to ensure that what comes easily and natural to us um, to recognize what uh, is it that my motion, my physical motion, is it uh, me uh, singing uh, a melody out loud, uh, what seems to come out uh, more naturally and something that actually accentuates uh, my creativity uh, while at the same time um, respected for, for, lack of a better, for lack of a better word that respecting like my accessibility um, needs. Um, so for example, when it came to um, creating compositions um, for uh, the musicians that were in my gospel group, um, basically my brother and I, we had to, my brother who's also a uh, disabled artist, um, we were using uh, two softwares that were not necessarily designed to communicate uh, with each other. Um, and that was Melodyne and Digital uh, Performer. And using those softwares, we used Melodyne to, to sing out the melodies of the bass line, of the electric guitar or the piano, or do some beatboxing um, for the drums and such. Um, and we would um, transfer uh, those, well, first fix the pitch correction and then transfer those into digital performer so that um, it sounds like a real instrument, like a bass guitar or uh, electric guitar uh, and such. And then we would have a full composition already um, created um, and ready to go for the musicians to um, to follow along. Um, so this method um, of repurposing and just like being, um, you know, creative around like what to expect uh, as an end result has started for quite some time. And um, that expression is not necessarily one direction or a specified recipe. Um, the way I expressed my creativity was through uh, either like movement and um, I'd have to figure out ways to make technology work based on how I express that my emotion. Um, so another example that I'll give is two years ago, um, we were in the UK um, and we were getting ready to present at Drake Music and we were just jamming and creating uh, different instruments. And um, the song that came to mind that when we were jamming was Blackbirds, um, a Blackbird Fly. Um, and we used light sensors um, to play the instrument. And with the light sensors, I actually use the lights that are on my chair. So I have LED lights on my chair and those were sending the signal um, to the sensors to make some noise. And um, I was also dancing at the same time, uh, which was me doing donuts on my chair uh, and such, um, which was uh, another uh, way of uh, uh, expression. And in addition to that, I was singing. So doing all those things, three things um, at the same time, where we're able to uh, create something that I hadn't actually tried or something that we hadn't really set out um, to do. Uh, and uh, that was, um, yeah, uh, that was a really cool experience. And um, yeah, um, now with the pandemic and with, uh, you know, uh, lack of contact and 
uh, not being able to jam with people in person, um, it has been uh, quite difficult. But um, as Charles and I, we've been developing uh, ways um, to have remote uh, jam sessions. Uh, it has uh, allowed me uh, to actually fall back in love with music technology and, uh, and, and performance uh, because honestly, the drive had dissipated. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and this actually like influenced for me to explore other projects like podcasts um, as a way to kind of fill in that gap of my uh, artist size. Uh, and for a while before we spoke about remote jamming, uh, I was worried that those opportunities would take a while um, to come back again uh, for us to be able to experiment with folks uh, in a room. Uh, but uh, with these remote uh, jams, um, there was like a little bit of hope that yes, there's a way we can engage uh, with people um, remotely and without having any lag either. <laughs> And also um, not having to deal with Zoom fatigue uh, because most of us are either engaging in Zoom for social purposes throughout the day or for work or school, what have you, and uh, partaking into an event that uh, would require Zoom uh, uh, was going to be quite a uh, taxing and, and um, for us to uh, yeah to do this way uh, we're able to at least reduce um, or remove some of the barriers related to like zoom fatigue um, and um, yeah and with that with the zoom fatigue and with my nine to five job um, <laughs> musical inspiration was like you know at times like slow to come um, but the advantages with like doing these jams remotely and these hacks remotely, we actually started to play music much faster than when we would do these things in, uh, in person, uh, which was actually quite uh, a pleasant surprise. Um, and um, yeah, it, uh, it was really shocking to, to see this and um, yeah. Um, and you may be wondering like, so with, uh, with, music, with accessible music technology and instruments, has this actually changed how uh, I express music? The answer honestly is no. Um, I simply have um, just expanded uh, my musical uh, expression. And uh, yeah, and this this expansion also has uh, you know to like the same level of passion that I have uh, when it comes to musical uh, creation. Um, and now, if I can go back a bit to uh, you know my my choir and how I arrange music, um, if there's actually like a difference between you know, organizing for, you know, a team of 18 people, uh, musicians and singers, um, to making experimental music with blurring the boundaries. The thing is like arranging for a choir um, or an organized ensemble, uh, it's, it's, it's quite different. It, it's like, there's a recipe book that has to be, you know, taken as a starting point. Uh, there's a beginning and then there's an end. Um, and you're working towards like a definitive finished product. But the recipe book is still not meant to necessarily be followed, um, you know, word for word, um, especially within the, the genre that I play with my choir, which is uh, gospel, R&B, soul, um, music. Um, Basically, the recipe book, the recipe book, metaphorically referring to the uh, uh, the music sheets, um, are there as a guide 
uh, not as like prescriptive. And uh, what this means is that when we are actually doing uh, live performances, um, improvisation is uh, vital um, in that extent. Now, let's fast forward 2021, experimental music. Um, the way I would describe experimental music, it's like soul food, you know, like family recipes that have been, you know, passed down from generation to generation, um, and they've changed through, through generations. Um, and, you know, there's an improvisation element uh, to it from the get-go. Um, there is no necessarily specific guideline on how many measuring cups um, or uh, seasonings uh, you need for, for the ingredients. Um, you basically have to use your intuition as long as the general flavor tastes the way you had imagined it to be. Um, and as long as it also creates uh, the atmosphere that gives you um, a high you know, and this can also be um, related to music as well. Um, my goodness, I'm salivating. I'm actually getting hungry talking about recipes. <laughs> um, but all this to say, uh, let me not get too caught up with these metaphors of like jazz improvisation, recipe book, and following generational um, uh, secret recipes. Um, the matter of the fact is with blurring the boundaries, um, we are not in like, the business of trying to publish recipe books. We are actually in the business of making soul food. Um, in a nutshell, access shouldn't be a prescribed cookie cutter approach. Um, that it shouldn't be based on a recipe book. Um, there should be room for pace, like personal taste and dietary uh, requirements. Um, so yeah, I hope um, you are able to create your own recipe book uh, in whatever artist uh, expression um, that you do uh, within your field. Thank you. Thanks, Gift. Um, I think. Uh... I'm really keen to hear what um, well, what what you've been up to, Stefan. We've been talking for quite some time, so I'll, we we've got some more stuff that we could play later on. But um, can you tell us something about what what is it that you do? <laughs> Where, what's your angle on all of this? Uh, yeah, um, I so I think disability started entering into my sound art installation kind of context first. Um, I was uh, at a residency in Banff and I had um, come up with this idea of making a motion sensor activated instrument and I got to kind of test it there, kind of create it and test it there. And basically it was a, um, it was using like Xbox cameras <laughs> and um, it would kind of, it, it was sort of designed around my own body and the limits of my own body. And as well as the kind of um, the way that my body moves. So it was kind of like a personal piano basically <laughs> um, that I then um, kind of, got to see other people playing. So it's kind of a, a general, the general approach was around like what, a question I asked myself around what the sound of my pain was. So I, I have a struggle with a few different chronic illnesses and um, one of the symptoms is, is um, chronic pain. And so I wanted to turn something very uh, depressing into something fun and funny and kind of interesting and just um, that would like allow people um, who don't experience or don't do not have the experience of my body um, to kind of behave to kind of behave in the form of my body in order to play the instrument um, 
and it was basically it was like a a, a flat scale and it just uh, each note kind of corresponded to um, color and a video and then you as you played you were kind of created um, different sounds through through your body. Um, so that was kind of one of the first um, installations I made that kind of directly tied to kind of, yeah, kind of difficult um, topic for me and also just a, um, a question that I didn't, I still don't have the answer to, like the idea of, of putting sound to to pain or the sound to an experience that is so embodied and so within within yourself. It's sort of something that I think captures why I, I love playing music so much and why I, I love sound as a medium in general for expressing the unexpressible. And um, yeah, I, so that's just to say a little bit about kind of where in terms of like creating musical instruments like where I've kind of my experience with that has been in more like an installation context um and then yeah I, um my collaborator Renee Dumaresk we we co-founded Crip Rave more around the lines of um party spaces and making um raves more accessible and we both love electronic music um and have had been really disappointed over time um, around the lack of accessibility. And we've, we've been putting on events this summer, uh, online events, of course. Um, and we just had one um, the other weekend and, um, you know, it was someone's like first rave ever. And, and just, just that kind of actually feeling like, okay, you know, this is like really necessary work. And I'm hoping that folks will kind of take accessibility more into consideration just even on the promotion side or the production side um, like in terms of live music so yeah a um, little different from instruments but I think it's definitely connected absolutely I mean I, I was um I was curious I was listening to a piece um earlier on um where I think you uh, you'd kind of you were making a political statement in in a situation where that people weren't necessarily ex expecting it was the piece with um, the Stephen Harper sample, um, mm -hmm. and I just I was wondering if that fitted into the 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 crit rave um, like how political does does that get um, or how do people respond if uh, if that yeah if they're being challenged in in some yeah I think. I think for now it's been just really supportive and I think um you know I think our hope is that down the road like in 10 years like cut to 10 years from now that our 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 organization is almost no longer needed you know um because the the accessibility has gotten so much better hopefully um I think We've we've generally been like really really supported um, locally, especially and in, in terms of like grant funding, it's been it's been you know really wonderful to see how much um, support there is. And I think it seems from the feedback we've gotten that it's just kind of a missing piece and something that that people were kind of um, didn't necessarily even know that they could access. Period. And so I, I I'm hoping that more kind of promoters and more more folks who you know control gallery spaces or like live like especially physical spaces I think um will take take accessibility more seriously because generally it seems like accessibility is usually an afterthought um when it comes to organizing events and so I think the work we're doing is obviously very political of course but it's also um very necessary and coming out of I think like I think that uh we're not doing anything um that people like that the disabled community hasn't already been doing for a long time we're really just trying to extend that access work into rave culture and sp specifically um and into kind of like live music late night kind of atmospheres uh, which is where it's rarely been situated 
I think this is possibly going to um, segue nicely into some of the questions that we've got coming through. Um, I had just another, just thinking about um, one of the flyers, I think said, um, go home early, it's great. Is that is that right? Yeah, go home early, it feels great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, as, as a, a former raver, I think I can, I can, I can, <laughs> I can relate to that. Or I mean, trying to perform as well. Um, yeah, that was something that was uh, starting to get me down quite a yeah. lot. Like four a.m. set, great. That's going to be a dangerous few hours between now and then. <laughs> but yeah. um, the, like tying into, I don't know the like what is it about rave rave culture that isn't accessible? Because I know a lot of mm. people would say it's a very inclusive space. Um, Obviously, there are there are definitely issues. Like, what could you say? What kind of access barriers specifically you're you're looking to break down? Or you're breaking down. Yeah, definitely. I think the one. I mean, the the kind of obvious one is one around just like the the spaces themselves. Like the spaces either having either being like down a flight of stairs or up another flight of stairs or just super narrow. You know, a lot of stairs, <laughs> narrow stairwells. Um, really generally like just like actually unsafe um environments like like um you know not having adequate lighting in terms of getting into the venue um not having fire exits like really just just basic safety um which i think you know just excludes like you know a number of of people completely um, from even being able to to consider accessing those events, and then there's there's the washrooms. Um, you know, like there's often just like no, there's like one bathroom. There's just so much of that that I think people, you know, when people kind of get, I think comfortable with that who who put on those events and then start stop questioning maybe like that those aren't really good conditions to to safely party and then there's all these other layers too around um yeah just like offering spaces where people can rest or take a break that's not that doesn't necessarily require them to like completely leave the space um and uh, you know there's other types of barriers too around you know having being able to offer um different different kinds of access points I think is something that that Renee and I think a lot about with Crip Brave so understanding that someone's access needs might contradict another person's access needs but just mm -hmm. trying your best to to accommodate different kind of levels of of access and comfort and and just doing your best as a promoter, I think people, my, my take is that I think people are scared of messing up and so then they don't try. And I, we're trying to change that a little bit, like change people's perception around that. And more, more importantly, like in our hiring, like we, we only hire disabled folks or people who identify as sick or crip or mad or deaf, like, it, you know, all across the board. And that's, that's everyone, you know, our graphic designers or our, everyone involved um and i think that's like that's like another point is like you don't really see a lot of disabled talent being put on bills i think that as with um we've got a few of these coming through we might not be able to get through to all of them but i i was thinking of maybe throwing this to both of you um so there's somebody um uh who works for a network of research, rehearsal spaces. So the question is, what, what do we think the biggest barrier is to making people feel welcome and included in traditional studio spaces? So going from the event to, um, to a different setup there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from my experience over the years, um, access, like accessing uh, rehearsal studio spaces, the biggest barrier is not knowing um, how accessible the space is uh, because there's usually lack of information from the owners. Um, and oftentimes it's, yes, it's accessible. We can get you in. And sometimes that means them carrying your wheelchair up the stairs. Um, that's the definition of uh, 
of, um, of an accessible space. Um, but um, honestly, I think simply just having information on like, is it a wheelchair accessible space? Is there a ramp? Is there automated door opener? Are the bathrooms mm -hmm. small or large? Are they accessible? Um, entrance, like what sort of entrance? Because there's been spaces where I've had to enter through the garage, uh, but the garage entrance is very steep, uh, which can be very dangerous um, as a wheelchair user to enter through the garage, even with assistance, because um, I personally use a power wheelchair. Um, with assistance, if a power wheelchair slides, it doesn't matter how strong the people are physically, uh, because it's more than 200 pounds of weight uh, that's pushing me, and then in addition to my weight, um, which I will not disclose. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so yeah, and also even a lot of the rehearsal spaces they would have, they'll be, they'll be not smoke-free uh, spaces and we would enter and it's full of smoke. And if I was someone who experiences barriers related to breathing, that's a huge, huge, huge barrier. Um, and sound too, like how good are sound insulations um, in, in terms of uh, how the space is designed. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'd say having as much information as possible is the most useful, but the biggest barrier is not having information at all and showing up to spaces and being surprised um, and having to deal with last minute uh, yeah, solutions. I hope that answered to your question. So, um, I, I mean, one thing that we've discussed in the past was an accessibility checklist. Is that something that, um, that I, either of you work yeah. with or that yeah. propose to people? Yeah, um, yeah I, I'll let Stefana just answer that. But yeah, I'll just quickly say that, yes, there's plenty of accessibility checklists online that would be a good starting point. Um, and uh, yeah, then again, like don't use it as like the end all be all, like, oh, we have the accessibility checking list, so everything's accounted for, which is not true, but it's a good uh, starting point. Yeah, and to add on um, to all the amazing points Gifts just made, thinking a little bit about like how to get to the venue even, or get to a rehearsal space, like um, really detailed information around transit options like the nearest transit options what the distance is like you know um if there's parking if there's um wheelchair accessible parking that kind of information i think is good to just include and also um something i've been thinking more about is like incorporating like access riders so kind of taking um you know this approach around the tech writer that musicians have. Um, and this is being done by a lot of um, disabled artists. Um, I kind of built mine around um, Johanna Hedva's example. And, you know, that's something that I think, um, yeah, folks in, uh, in the music industry or folks running rehearsal spaces or anything like that can take into account. And even just having, you know, wherever you would input information, like your name, you know, um, having inviting people to share access needs, I think is like a really good step um, because that makes makes it more easy for you as a host to to accommodate and to make sure people's needs are met and to have enough time to plan too and kind of again to to build access into the planning of everything of events and of bringing people together rather than kind of trying to figure it out last minute, because that doesn't usually work. There was something that came up earlier on about being afraid of getting things wrong. Um, so, I mean, is there anything we could say about that in terms of how we could move forward, how people can move forward if they're concerned about that? Um, 
so for example, uh, I mean, one one access barrier perhaps, or the solution to that getting in the way of somebody else's, is, are there any particular kind of practical? Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I would say having, I haven't, well, I can't talk, but I'm tired. Okay, I would say having an open door uh, policy, meaning that these are the access um, things we have taken into account. Um, if there are any access needs you may have that are not mentioned here, please reach us and we'll uh, make it happen or, yeah. We'll see how we can make it happen. So having that open policy and being aware that not everything is accounted for, I think um, it creates uh, an understanding and there's, it reduces the fear of not uh, trying to meet um, every access checklist um, one could think of. Hope that helps there. I know that we're we're kind of reaching the end of the the slot that we um, that we had officially. Um, one thing I'd say is, if we don't have a chance to answer these things, then people would be very welcome to reach out to us on social media. Um, so for blurring the boundaries, that's blur the boundary on Twitter. Um, possibly the best way to to find this uh, would be through the Sled Island uh, website for this event. Um, so that, because there are quite, I think I'm getting a sense from the questions coming through that it's, there's a need for this information in terms of this. There are standard that can be accessed. Um, is there a clear way of indicating um, certain information about access? Um, just as, I mean, as we're, as we're wrapping up, there is, there's one aspect that I found, um, I, I guess we haven't touched on and that's um, how events are signposted in terms of how, they're, how, they're, how the invitations are sent out. And I, I noticed on, on YouTube for the Crip Brave events, there were some exclusive ASL videos. Um, I'm just, I mean, personally kind of curious to find out a bit more about the out, like reaching out in that way and what's necessary in that way as well. About the, the vlogs that we posted? What? Um, I guess uh, I kind of stumbled upon these, <laughs> um, but in terms of, I, I'm thinking in terms of different formats and representation mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it becoming tokenistic if, um, if it's, if then it's not followed up on, but mm -hmm. um, there's one more. Oh yeah. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'm going to conclude that thought there, but. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I think I'm reaching the end of my, uh, <laughs> the end of my energy here, actually. Sorry, it's been quite a long. Um, maybe we should quit while we're ahead. I don't. Um, was there anything that you wanted to say in response to that? Sorry, before I completely. Uh, um, no, I, I was just thinking. Um, yeah, one thing we, we were trying to kind of take into account with our events um, this summer was just um, doing outreach specifically in the deaf community. So having. Um, ASL vlogs um, that would actually go through, you know, the details of the events. Um, and uh, we use an amazing uh, organization we worked with uh, called Deaf Spectrum and they're, they do amazing work um, and uh, they're Toronto based. And they also um, connected us with our music ASL interpreters. And I think that's that's something I just wanted to make sure I didn't forget to say, which is just in general, I think in terms of live music, that's a, a hugely, you know, underexplored um, way to express and to to kind of bring in um, access into, into live music. And I think an incredibly powerful way and um, in a way that's, uh, being done, especially I've, I've seen a lot more in hip hop. Um, so around like rap verses, but um, that's, it's not limited to at all to hip hop or to, to a specific genre. So I know 
I'd love to see more um, live music uh, events with uh, music ASL interpreters. I think that'd be really cool. So we've got one last uh, one that's come through. Um, yeah, this would be a great one to close on just in terms of like artists that, that we know of. Are there any artists that musicians that um, that we can point people to? The question is, it's actually more about like people who are directly using the kinds of technology that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, do we have any? Yeah, who can we, uh, <laughs> who can we point people to to check this out? Uh, I'd say John Travel. John Travel is someone, uh, uh, a great, a great artist based in the UK uh, that I highly recommend to check out. Um, and uh, Miss Jackie. Uh, Jackie is in J A C Q U I. Uh, yeah, those are the top that could come into my mind at this present moment. But yeah. Stefana, do you, uh, yeah, can you um, think of anybody? I think more, maybe more in the, on the sound art installation side. Um, I'm a really big fan of a uh, sound artist, Christine Sun Kim, mm -hmm. um, who's an incredible um, American uh, deaf sound artist, I think now based in Berlin. But uh, I really recommend everyone uh, check out their work. <laughs> I think we'll, yeah, we'll need to find some more links uh, and maybe send those out afterwards to, to really follow up on, yeah, we'll tweet a few um, from our end. Um, so at this point, unless I, yeah, unless anybody's got anything to add, I might slowly back That's away from great. the confusion myself. This, this was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, let's all slowly. <laughs> No, awesome, but yeah, yeah, thank you both. Thanks, Charles uh, and Stefana. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Gift. This was lovely.